Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome and thank you for being with us today. A shout out to all those that are joining us online. I'm excited. I'm Pastor Ken, the, the senior pastor here at Vertical Church, and we're beginning a new series today. And here's the title of the series, Grow Up. Because why? God wants us to grow up to attain to everything he has for us to do. We're going to talk about growing up spiritually. And what we're going to discover is that growing up spiritually, there are similarities to natural growth. Because there are stages of growth. Like there are with, with, with natural growth, there are infancy and childhood and adolescence and then adulthood. Okay? And there are stages within the spiritual reality in the same capacity. But listen. The difference is this. With natural things, we tend to kind of automatically kind of get to there, although I do say there, I have met people who are older that act immature all the time. True maturity is what we're talking about, attaining unto true spiritual maturity. And that's what my heart and desire is for all of us, that we would attain to that end, because it's not automatic. Time is not a factor, necessarily. Now, the spiritual growth is not instantaneous, but how long you've been walking with Jesus is not an indicator of your spiritual maturity. Even knowledge, things that you've heard, things that you've seen, that alone is not a factor because it's not what you know, it's what you do with what you know that will determine whether you grow. And that's the truth of the matter is that people get stuck in stages of spiritual maturity, you know, in stages of growth, I should say, not, you know, preventing them from reaching maturity. And through the course of this series, I want to dispel some myths and ideas and false ideas that people have about what true spiritual maturity looks like. We're going to look at it from the biblical end because here's the heartbeat. This is what my desire is through the course of this series, is that all the people who really desire to grow up and mature spiritually is to give you the practical instruction and wisdom about how to actually go about it. Really, really practical. Today's just the intro into this. So I pray that you hold, stay with me through the course of this series because we're going to talk about it. It kind of gives you a gauge that you can measure yourself by because if you don't know where you are, you won't know where to get, how to get to where you're going. It always begins with identifying where you are so you know how you get to where you're going. And so that's what this series is about. That's what my heart's desire because we're going to look at it from a biblical point of view. Because the Bible teaches us that there are stages of spiritual growth on that end. And why is all this important? Why do we need to talk about this? Why is it important what we do on this end? How many people here are parents and have kids or you've ever been a kid? How many people here? Okay, that includes everybody, right? Yeah, what's the deal? You know, if you're a parent, what do you entrust to your children? Well, you recognize that you only give them a much, as much as they can handle the responsibility for. And any of us recognize that with growth, with maturity, come opportunity, come privileges, correct? Think about it naturally speaking. You have to be 16 before you're even able to drive, right? Then you have to take a test and do all the rest. But until you reach that end, you know, you can't be six years old and get behind the wheel of a car. I'm not talking about a car car with the battery in it. I'm talking about a real deal car, okay? You have to be. We know this. You have to be a certain age to go into the military. You have to be a certain age before you can vote. There's certain ages, uh, you know, connected to entertainment aspects and choices that you have, right? And even this, to serve in Congress, all right, you have to be a certain age. Because maturity brings opportunity. And any good parent recognizes that you desire your children to grow up. So why? They can attain to all the things that life will bring their way that without such, and no parent would entrust their children with responsibilities that they weren't able to fulfill. That would be bad parenting, correct? You know, you give your three-year-old control of, the, uh, 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 of certain aspects. Of that. You know, that's crazy, okay? No, no. We recognize that end, but how much more our Heavenly Father desires us to grow up so that, we, so that He can what, entrust things to us, things that He would never be able to do in our lives and through our lives until we know how to handle the responsibilities 
associated with it. And that's why all of this is important, because I believe God has so much more for us to experience, so much more for us to do. But it is important that we grow up. And so if you have a Bible this morning, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians. We call it a book, really it is a letter or an epistle, okay? Now an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. It just means a letter to one of the churches that were established. When you get to be in a Bible reader, I encourage you all to be regular readers, regulars, get into the word, know and understand the things that are contained in here. But listen, Paul wrote a majority of these to churches that he started around the Mediterranean Rim. And the city of Ephesus was one of the cities that Paul planted a church in, and this church really became mature. It grew, the church at Ephesus, and he wrote this epistle, this letter to them while he was in prison. And it's really mature in this regard because it kind of gives a clear understanding of God's plan and purpose that he had in mind. In fact, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that God had a mystery that was hidden until the right time for him to unfold it, which is the church. The idea of the word church, ecclesia, although in Greek it had other meanings, but from a spiritual point of view, it was a mystery that God had hidden until the time frame that he would reveal this. And Paul begins to unfold these ends. And Jesus said these words. He said, I will build my church. Well, through Paul, he began to give instruction of how he actually accomplishes that mission. And so here is this, this text that we're going to read this morning is where this series came from. So in Ephesians 4, we're going to begin in verse 11. And I'm going to be looking at it out of the Message Bible because I just like the way it says that it's easy to understand and it gives us some insight and depth that I want to highlight in here. So look, I'm talking about Jesus because when Jesus arose from the dead, the Bible said he ascended into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And when he did such, it says he handed out gifts of apostles prophet, evangelist, and pastor, and teacher. Now, in the church world for years, we've called these the fivefold ministry. In other words, they're a form of gift. They've been given to the body of Christ. For what reason? It tells us right here. To train Christ followers. In other words, the role of the fivefold ministry is to help everyone who's in Christ to attain to all that God has for them. And how so? Training them the followers of Christ, in skilled servant work. Why? Why would that be the aim? Because, see, the ultimate objective, true maturity in Christ is to be like Christ. That should be the target that we're all aiming for, which shows that all of us still are a work in progress. All of us have more to attain to and to grow into. Because the ultimate objective is to grow up into Christ. And why would skilled servant work be the importance? Because Jesus, the Bible said, though he was God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of a man. So in essence, if Christ's ultimate aim was to be a servant, then to grow up into Christ means that we would follow him in that end. So followers are in skilled servant work, where? Working within Christ's body, the church. Here the mystery is explained. The church is the true body of Christ, which means all of us have a role. All of us have a part. If we are in truth a body, no one part is more significant than another part. Every part matters, which means to all of us who are here, God has something that he has called and uh, designed for us to fulfill. But until we grow up, we may never fulfill the role that God had in mind for us to play. And so it's working within Christ's body, the church, until what? Until we're all moving rhythmically and easily with each other. Do you know what? It takes maturity to get along, doesn't it? I remember when I first got saved, I thought everyone in the church was a saint. I said, that I, I had proof, man. There were wings that were growing out their backs. And then I, then I had people act carnally, and I'm like, well, those are just shoulder blades. Those ain't wings. No, we're all a work in progress, okay? 
And the more we grow, the more we are able to work, I love this, rhythmically and easily. See, the more mature we become, the easier it is to get along with one another. The easier it is to work in, in synchronization with one another. We're all like an orchestra that God is the conductor of. And all of us have the part to play. And all of us, when we play our parts, create a symphony that could never be uh, 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 done without everybody playing together. But it's all got to work together, which means it requires us to grow up. It requires us to mature so that we get along with each other, that we work rhythmically and easily together, efficient and what? Graceful. Ooh. Yeah, graceful in response to God's Son. It takes grace on these ends. Look, it goes on to say this in verse 14, or in the end of 13, listen. Fully mature adults. That's what God's ultimate aim is, that we would become, become fully mature adults. Fully developed within and without. Fully alive. Here's the aim. Like Christ. Why? Because he goes on to say, you and I need to recognize God's ultimate aim is when all of us are fulfilling the position and working together as one, the world gets to see Jesus in a way it would never see otherwise. That's why you and I can't attain to full maturity alone. We do need one another. If we are in truth a body, our ability to attain to everything God has for us has to do with being interconnected and interdependent with one another. And that is important. He said, but look at this. This is where the Bible gives indication that there are stages of growth. He said full adults, but here he says, no prolonged infancies among us, please. Why was the Apostle Paul begging them not to remain infants? Because it was entirely possible to do so. And in the church world, people sometimes get stuck. And see, we don't always understand on that end. When my children were just toddlers, where did they eat at the table? What seat did they sit in? Anybody want to take a guess at it? In the high chair, right? Because when they're children, when they're infants, they just want what they want, right? They indicate, they cry, they scream till they get what they want. That's what it means to be a child, right? And spiritually speaking, we can be stuck in childhood or infancy when we cry about everything, because the seat that we're sitting at at church is called the I chair. In other words, it's all about me. And when you first come into the body of Christ, yes, we're born again. Yes, we become babies. But there has to be a progression. There has to be a growth. When it's not just about me, but how can I help others? How can I grow beyond myself to care about what's going on in the lives of other people? To truly be like Jesus? I can't get stuck in the eye chair. Okay, so this series is about taking off the pampers, growing up and realizing that God has something for all of us to attain to. But we can get stuck. And that's why he's begging them, no longer pro prolonged infancies among us, please. We'll not tolerate baby, babes in the woods, small children. Now why? Why would Apostle Paul say this? Is he not, does he not care about people? No, listen, this is so critical. He says, small children who are an easy mark for imposters. Do you know, I've watched over the years, I've been at this a long time, people who didn't grow in their faith in the capacity they should have become susceptible to false things, wrong ideologies. They start following some minister and you go, where are you getting that from? What scriptures are you basing that upon? Oh, you got to see Pastor Ken. Oh, I had this experience. Okay. You got to go a little deeper for me on this. You know that's not biblical, right? Oh, we're beyond that. You got to understand. I mean, I just had somebody talking to me in between services today. So many times I have run into this. Where people, they think it's a level of maturity to go back underneath the law. Oh, I mean, we, we celebrate the Sabbath. I, I don't, Saturdays, don't do that. I'm, I'm going to do, you know, all of these festivals of the Jewish people. I'm part of that. God pro, pro, made these for impropriety. I'm like, dude, do you read the New Testament? Seriously. But this stuff comes up again and again. And I've seen some of this stuff recycle. And when people are immature, 
They are susceptible to the latest fad, to the latest craze, to the things that come along, and the next thing you know, people's lives become shipwrecked spiritually because they follow something that doesn't have any true stability in it. And then they become disenchanted and walk away altogether. See, they become an easy mark for the enemy. And it works in this way. And notice this next verse. This is where the, the series comes. God wants us to do what? Grow up. God wants, see, it's not Pastor Ken. God wants us to grow up. Okay? So I want you to say that with me. Say this with me. God wants me, God wants me. to grow up. So turn to the person next to you and tell them, grow up. Now turn to the one on the other side that you ignored and tell them, grow up. Now tell the person who needs to hear it the most, tell yourself, grow up. It's time, church, to grow up. It's time to wean off the bottle and get on. It's time to, to mature. It's time to be everything. God wants us to grow up. And what does it mean? To know the whole truth. Oh, one of the things that disturbs me so much, we get people in the body of Christ, what I call favorite word people. They have certain scriptures they love. They're like, no, 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 talk to me about those over there. No, 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 I don't deal with that one. They kind of think like, you know, the Bible is kind of like, you know, TGI Friday salad bar or like Burger King, okay? God's not Burger King. You can't say hold the pickles and the lettuce, okay? No, God says you need it all because like any good parent, when your child is learning to eat, they want all the sweet stuff, right? They don't want the meat or the vegetables when you puree it all. You know, what do they do with it? Right? They spit it out. They play with it. They throw it, right? But you give them the applesauce. You give them the fruit. They eat all that, right? Yeah, in the body of Christ, there's no difference. Some people, oh, I, they want all the sweet stuff. I call it spiritual candy because it doesn't really create anything. You know, it's a lot of head stuff. People get into, oh, the end times, Pastor Ken, I'm watching for the Antichrist. And I'm like, oh, that's great, okay? God didn't call you to be a spectator, okay? You need to get off the stands and get in the game, okay? There's a world that needs to be saved, okay? But, you know, you, you know there's a lot of people that get into all this crazy stuff that doesn't actually promote maturity. God needs us, so you need a well-balanced diet. You need to grow up. And he says, what? How do you do so? To know the whole truth and tell it in love. If you were here last week, I said, you know, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace makes truth palatable. Truth's the only thing that can change you. But grace makes it. And I got a perfect illustration this week. My kids were watching on demand. They were watching that show, you know, America's Got Talent. And anybody remember the guy, Simon Crowell, the, you know, the, the, the guy that's a judge, used to be on uh, um, American Idol or whatever before? Well, he's the perfect illustration of truth without grace. Now, what he says actually will help people if they'll take it, but the manner in which he does, people are like, oh, my God, that's harmless, right? We need both. And he says, listen, we need to know the whole truth and tell it in love. That's a part of maturity. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Well, I told them the truth. Mm, yeah, but did you do so in love? Well, I love them, that's why I told them the truth. No, 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 you got that wrong. In love, the way in which you do it, it's maturity, right? Like Christ in everything, that's the ultimate aim. We take our lead from Christ, who is the source of everything we do. Now look at this in verse 16. He keeps us in step with each other. In other words, we serve under one head, his Jesus Christ. And that's how we stay in link with one. We need one another. But we answer to Christ. Therefore, if I have a problem with my brother and sister, technically, I have a problem with Christ. Because the last time I checked, he's their Lord and Savior. Right? If I have a problem with my brother and sister, I have a problem with my father in heaven because they're his kids too. Right? So we keep in step with each other. His very breath and blood flow through us, nourishing us so that we will grow up. Listen, so that we will what? Grow up. Healthy in God. Robust in love. You know what he's saying here? You can't do that alone. We need one another. We do this in unity together. So it's time, church. We need to 
grow up. Look at this scripture in 1 Corinthians 3. The apostle Paul wrote to a church that he planted in the city of Corinth. And he said to them, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? In other words, these were two men who fulfilled a role in the fivefold ministry. And he said, what are we? You know, what am I? Okay. He said, only servants. See, to be like Christ means, and here's the point. When you serve people, sometimes it can be a thankless job. I mean, I don't want anybody to feel bad, but you know what? A lot of times I'll stand up here, I spend all week preparing to share something, and you give your heart out, and then you realize, wow, crickets. I wonder if this helped anybody. I wonder if this did anything for anybody. Oh my goodness, you can feel like, wow. And people will have no problem throwing rocks back this way. You know, if they don't like something you said and all, but yeah, that just goes with the territory because look at what he said, only servants. Everything I do doesn't have any self-interest. It has one area. I want everybody to attain to what Christ has for them. That's why we give it. He said, only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. Now, what was he saying? Go to the next verse, verse six. I planted the seed. That's one part. Today, all of us are here. Seeds are being distributed. The opportunity for them to be planted. He said, I planted, Apollos watered it, but this is, this is what I want you to hear out of this. But God has been making it to grow. The only one that can cause true growth in your life is Almighty God. See, you can talk a big game, you can fool your neighbor, you can fool other people, you can fool me, but the one you can't fool is Almighty God. Because it ain't what you can quote, it ain't what you know, it's what you do with what you know that cooperates with God. Because what you do with what you know is the only thing that'll make you grow. That sounds pretty good, okay, we'll keep that. And buddy, who goes on to say in verse seven, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything. In other words, I'm no big deal. This is just my responsibility. Yeah, thank you, Deb, I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. No, we're nobody, but only God who makes things grow. Right? It's God ultimately, it's all about Him. The ability for us to achieve is because we work in conjunction with what God's provided, okay? And He works in us. So, I want you to turn in your Bible to Mark chapter four. In fact, as you're turning there, we're gonna spend the rest of our time through the course of this next few minutes in this particular area. I encourage you this week to read this more than once, the whole chapter, because this is so critical to understand. Jesus is about to tell the chief parable of all parables. Parables was just a story to help a spiritual truth to be understandable to the audience to whom he was giving it. And Jesus told a parable that when his disciples asked him the meaning of it, he said to them, if you don't understand this one, then you can't understand any of them. So it is absolutely critical for us to recognize. Because Jesus, one day, the Bible says, a great crowds had gathered around the Sea of Galilee to hear him teach. And so he got into a boat and he began to teach. And he began to teach in a way again so that everyone would have opportunity to understand. You didn't have to have a seminary degree. Jesus said a farmer went out to sow seed. And some of the seed that he sowed fell on the pathway, the wayside, and the birds came and immediately ate it up. And other seed that he cast fell among a shallow soil that was rocky, and, the so and immediately the soil caused the seed to sprout quickly and grow up, but it had no root. And when the sun came up, it scorched it, and it withered away. And other seed fell among soil that had thorns in it, and the seed began to grow, but the thorns began to grow, and the thorns choked the seed so that it didn't produce fruit. And other seed fell on good ground, and, so, and that yielded 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Then Jesus walked away. And here's the key. He said something that was so interesting. Jesus said, and he who has ears to hear, in fact, he said it more than once in the context because it was so important. He said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did Jesus really believe people didn't have these flappers on the side of their head? What did he mean? You know as well as I do, there is a different way you listen when you're intent to understand. There is a different way you pay attention 
with what is being spoken if you're responsible to do something with it. Because there's casual listening, and we do a lot of casual listening because we don't expect to do anything with what we heard. But then there's a the time, and you all know when we're faced with it, is whenever you need to go do something, and you're like, ooh, what were those instructions again? There's an intent to want insight. There's an intent to want depth of understanding. There's an intent to just not want to hear, but to want to understand. And that's what Jesus is getting to, because what he goes aside, his disciples, in other words, the one that really cared, the ones that wanted to follow, the casual observer is never the one that will gain the insight. Jesus said there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. But who will it be revealed to? The one that is intent to want to know, to want to understand, that will be diligent to pursue and to gain insight. Who will ask questions? And there were certain ones that came aside and said, Master, can you explain that parable to us? And he said, it is for you. Unto you is given the secrets of the kingdom of God. See, any one of us can be that way. In fact, Jesus said this. Be careful what you hear. Why? Because what you hear will determine what's developed in you. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But when you hear the wrong things, it can create fear in you. It can create mistrust in you. It can create confusion in you. That's why you have it. But he also didn't say that. He also said, it's not just what you hear. He also said, it's how you hear. Why? Because to have an attentive ear to pay attention closely, to ask enough questions so that you can gain understanding, it is to them that Jesus will reveal. In fact, he said it this way. I love it in the Amplified Bible. When you read Mark 4 and Amplified, it says, the measure of thought and study we give to the truth we hear is the measure of power and effectiveness that God works through our lives. So it's really, my friends, what you need to understand, it is all about what we do with what we hear. So Jesus goes into it and says this. The sower sows the what? The word. You and I need to understand the entire kingdom of God operates in this fashion. Everything God does, he does by his word. And he calls his word seed, which is powerful if you understand the concept behind that. Because every seed is pre-programmed to produce exactly what it was designed to produce. Now, there's an element of faith in that because when you look at a tomato seed, you don't see fruit, you don't see vine, you don't see flower, you don't see all that stuff. You have to have the faith to say, you know what? If I plant this seed, it has the ability to bring to pass what it was pre-programmed to do. You and I need to realize that the way we grow has everything to do with what we do with God's word. If you don't hear anything else I say today, please understand that your spiritual growth is entirely dependent on what you do with God's word. Because every promise of God has the ability to bring to pass everything God said it would do. Because you and I need to recognize that it is not the word of man. Where God's word is different than what everybody else says is everybody might have a great intention to do what they say they will do. Only God has unlimited power to bring to pass everything he's promised he would do if you believe it, if you accept it and hold fast to it. You see, there's a difference within that end. And that's why you have to assess it. Paul commended the Thessalonians. He said, when you heard what I said, you did not receive it as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which works effectively in those that believe it. In other words, you have to recognize God's kingdom operates in this fashion. That's why when I ask people, this is kind of an occupational hazard. I, people come to me and it's like, oh, do you, what do you believe in God for? And they'll tell me and I'm like, okay, so what are you basing that belief on? And very rarely can people ever tell me a promise of God's word that they are basing what they believe on. Now, they say, well, Pastor Ken, are you trying to say to me that's wrong? I'm like, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. How do you know it's right? Well, doesn't God want me to have that? Well, how do you know? You see, we know the will of God 
because his word is his will. God tells us, God's not a man that he would lie. Whatever God has spoken, he will perform if we do not let go. That's why the scripture says, whatever you sow, you reap. But don't grow weary in well-doing. For in due season, you will reap. What? If you don't give up. It's powerful. That's so true. Your life can change today to be everything God wants it to be. If you understand what it is God is and you believe it, receive it, and hold fast to it. It will make all the change because it will do what you're incapable of doing because it is in truth the word of God. And that's why it's important. The sower sows the word. And what does he say? Because this parable, really, every single condition, there are four types, and it really is about the condition of a soil. Okay? Every one of the individuals spoken about in this parable all had the exact same situation. They all heard the same thing. But the results were tied specifically to the condition of the soil. And let's find out what that is. He said, these are the ones by the wayside where the what? Where the word is sown. When they hear what? Satan, you need to know the one that despises everything that God has spoken and everything God wants to do in your life. The enemy of your soul is not flesh and blood. It is Satan and he's only, in, he's only bent on one thing. Stopping the word from being productive in your life. Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So, what's the soil? The heart. Go back to that verse again. Sorry, guys. The soil is the heart. So really what he's talking about are four conditions of the human heart. You see, the ability for God's word to produce in you has everything to do with how much you take care of the condition of your heart. That's why Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived, the wisest one beside Jesus that ever lived on this earth was Solomon. And he said, above all else, guard your heart. Why? Because out of it flow the issues of life. The condition of the human heart has everything to do with whether or not God's word can produce in the fashion in which God sent it to do. Because God sent his word and it does not return to him void. His word is incorruptible. It just needs to find the right conditions to grow in. And you and I need to be wise and understand that. The first area where he said, go back, verse 15 again. Wayside, what is that? Let's talk about this pathway. What is a pathway? It's something that's been tread upon before. And what condition of the human heart? When you walk over things over time, it gets hard. And here's the problem that people fall into. They'll hear something taught and they'll go, well, I've heard that before. Off. Oh, that verse again? Like we have so much productivity from it. Like we've, now I always say to people, you ate breakfast yesterday. Did you eat it again today? Okay? But we can get to a place where we become resistant. We don't listen the same. We're not receptive to receive what God is speaking. God's word is alive. It will always produce. But it has to find a place. And Satan takes advantage of that end and steals the opportunities of God when we allow our heart to get hardened. Secondly, verse 16, he goes on to say, And these likewise are the ones sown on, what? Stony ground. Who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. You know, I've been in church long enough where I've had people come, man, that was the best message ever. Oh, that was fantastic. Oh, Pastor Ken, I was watching TV and I heard this message and it was amazing. I was on Right Now Media and man, that was an amazing message. Okay, that's great. They hear it. They received it with gladness. But then what happens? Verse 17. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Why? What's the time? Afterward, when tribulation, which means troubles, trials, difficulties, when tribulation or persecution, people not accepting, people not celebrating what you believe, persecution arises for what? The word's sake. Please understand that. That's Satan's whole game plan. It's about stopping God's word from producing in your life. When persecution or, or trials or tribulations come, 
for the word's sake, what happens if they're shallow, if they have rocky soil? Immediately they stumble. The word stumble there in the Greek is the word scandalon. It's translated multiple ways in the New Testament. One of the ways is offended. People get upset. You know one of the people they get upset at? People like me. And if they're really honest about it, they get mad at God. Well, you know, I tried that and it didn't work. You know, I started believing that, and then people started giving me a hard time. You know what? I told my girlfriend, we ain't sleeping together anymore. That's not what God wants from me until we get married. And she said, well, see you later, Jack. I'm, this, is, this is crazy. I didn't, I didn't sign up for that. See, when we start following God, not everybody goes, hey, that's a great thing. You know, you may be in a family and you're the first one that came to Christ and you start to put li your life in order and you stop doing certain things you used to do and people go, why are you doing that? Why don't you do that anymore? What, do you think you're better than me now? Or, God forbid, you start giving some of your money to the church and your family goes crazy and says, you've been brainwashed. You joined a cult. And we go, whoa, whoa, I didn't sign up for that. And what happens is God is prevented from bringing what he promised to pass in your life. Not because the word failed, but because they gave up. They got offended. They stumbled over it. They stopped doing it. Thirdly, next verse, verse 18. Now these are they, the ones that are sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. Okay, everybody had the same condition. We all heard the word, okay? But look at verse 19. And the cares of this world. In other words, the bills that have to be paid, the clothes that have to be washed. It's summertime, so we have outdoor work, not just indoor work to do. We have kids' schedules to take care of. We have things we have to do. All of us deal with that, right? The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, because we don't ever intend that. I mean, it's deceitful. You know what that means? It's deceiving. You don't realize when you're there. So oh, I'm going to take another job, a little more money, and you don't realize the one that's getting crowded out in your life is God. The deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things, this is amazing to me. I, we as human beings, when we really want something, we figure out a way to get it. We're going to be bent on getting it, okay? For, and the desire for other things entering in, what do what? Choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. When I talk to people, it's like, you know, can you give God at least a few minutes of your day? Well, Pastor Ken, you don't understand my lifestyle. You don't know my job. You don't know my commute. You don't know my kids. You don't know this. And I'm like, no, I don't. I can, there's a part, we all have responsibilities. But if your life is too busy, that God has no place, then you're prohibiting him from being able to do what only he can do. There's time for a reordering and a restructuring because you'll never grow up until you're willing to let go of some things. There has to be choices always made. Isn't that a part of what maturity requires? You tell your kids, you can't do everything. You need to choose one, two, three, right? And that's why I say you can be an adult in name only. You ever see adults act like kids? Yeah, just turn on TV and watch Congress. I mean, it's just crazy, right? You watch grown people act like kids all the time. But priorities determine this. Okay, if God doesn't become a priority in my life, if I don't give attention to these ends, I prohibit what only God can do, helping me to grow up, okay? See, God works in you so that he can work through you. We want him to just show up and do it all. You know, God, take care of this, take care of that. God goes, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll do it through you. I start in you so I can work through you. No, 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 God, just, just do it. And God says, whoa, allow me to do it. The way I work is through you. No other way. He wants us to grow. Because why? He wants us to be fruitful. That's what lasts for eternity, my friends. And then look at verse, verse 20. But these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. There's always a progression. There's always a growth process. There's always a means of becoming better and better at being productive so that the things of God working through our lives become more and more. So if you're taking notes with me, let's, let's cover some of the material that we've did. First area is this. 
Number one is God's kingdom works off the principle of seed time and harvest. The more you understand that, the wiser you become. Because everything that God does in your life begins as a seed. Something that you need to receive, something that you need to believe, something you need to hold on to, something that begins to change you from the inside out. It changes the way you see your world. It changes even your feelings and desires if you allow it to grow when it begins to germinate and sprout and root. So much happens in you before you ever see anything on the outside. But God's kingdom works in this fashion. See, Jesus was the word made flesh. The way you and I become conformed to Christ, which was God's ultimate aim for us, is that we allow the word to become flesh in us, to let Christ be reproduced through our lives. Number two, what's sown determines what's grown. It is quite that simple, but it is true. See, there are areas of change you need in your life God's word has a promise associated to it. People say, well, you know what? I need more patience. Well, guess what? That's one of the fruit of the spirit. You can't believe, but I need it to happen now. I need this right away. I said, whoa, it takes time, okay? And all the things that God wants to work, you know, you might have an issue with anger. You might have a relational crisis. Well, guess what? God's word can work in you. If you keep your heart clean, if you allow God's word to not butt up with, you know, you got an issue with anger, you feel justified telling somebody off. Well, you got to let God's word wrestle on the inside of you that you stop feeling justified and start saying, no, self-control is what I need. That is a work of the spirit. God, I surrender. I'm stop looking for all the excuses as to why I can and start saying, God, I agree with you. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away, all things became new. What you couldn't do yourself, the Bible says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But you got to get a hold of the scripture. You got to lay it, you got you to sow it in your heart. David said, how does a young man keep his way clean? According to your word. According to your word. It's holding on steadfast. What you sow determines what you grow. Thirdly, growing is proportional to knowing. Growing is proportional to knowing. But let me help you with this. We'll cover this further in weeks ahead as we kind of unfold this. When I say knowing, I don't mean intellectual knowledge alone. Obviously, if you're ignorant of it, you can't experience it, right? Whatever you're ignorant of, if you had money in the bank but you didn't know it was there, you could live your life poor, right? You're ignorant, you won't experience it. But this is not talking about intellectual knowledge. It's talking about experiential knowledge because biblical knowledge is things gained through experience. Question, Would, if you needed surgery in your body and somebody just graduated from, you know, from, from medical school but never had done a surgical procedure before, but they had all the book knowledge. In fact, they were valedictorian, but they've never actually operated on anybody. You'd be patient one. Would you be willing to go through that procedure or would you want somebody with some experience? See, here's the problem. We are willing to tell everybody else what they need to do without having ever done it ourselves. Oop, we won't go there. Okay, listen, the true experience how we train and teach others is by what we've learned through experience ourselves. That's when we know. And growing is proportional to knowing. That what I gain experience at is what I grow in. And that's what it is. And the last one, listen, listen. Take your notes, lastly. My responsibility for the seed, which is what? The word of God, right? Is to receive. In other words, when I hear the word of God, it's not to argue with it. I might not feel it, I might not even agree with it, but it, because it is the word of God, I go about tr getting myself in a position to agree with God instead of trying to make God agree with me, which will never happen. Because God never changes. We change. And that's always for our best. But I need to receive it. I need to keep the weeds out. My responsibility for the seed is to receive weed, water, and feed. In other words... You see, only you can keep your heart clean. Only you can keep the clutter out of your life. 
Only you can reorder this stuff. You know it as well as I do. When things arise in your heart and you need to forgive somebody, you need to release stuff, you need to get, you need to keep your heart clean because otherwise it inhibits God's word from being able to produce all that God wants to do in your life. You got to keep the weeds out. You got to keep all the clutter out. You got to give God time and opportunity. Only you can do that. Only you have God given the responsibility to manage the condition of your heart. You need to water it, which means that you need to hear it again and again. You need to remind yourself. You need to speak it. You need to say it. You need to believe it. You need to stay watered in that end. See, hearing it once is never enough. You know what my hope is? That people would actually, actually take notes, go home this week and go over it and actually want God to give them insight into how this works. As opposed to just going, well, I don't know why these are in here. Let's throw this away when we go. But just waste the paper. No, my hope is that God will take it from pen and paper and write it on the very table of your heart. But you have to go over things continually to have them in you. Right? You gotta, and you got to feed it. You see, growth, just like naturally speaking, what we eat and what we do. See, if you just eat and don't exercise, the growth you experience may not be great growth. <laughs> but when you eat right and exercise, you gain strength. There is a growth associated with that. That's why you have to take care of your heart. That's why you have to water the word. That's why you have to feed it. That's why you have to stay faithful to it because it will grow. And God's the one that sets the timetable, not us. But when you allow it, when you believe it, when you're committed to allowing God to do what only God can do, when you won't grow weary in well-doing, when you stay faithful to the course, when you hold on because it is the word of God. It's not a promise of a man that would lie. It is the promise of a God who cannot lie. God is faithful and I'm going to allow it to grow. God will bring it to pass. Now imagine with me, guys, if we actually became through the course of this series committed to growing up and allowing God opportunities to allow his word to take a place in our heart that maybe we've never given it before. Imagine what God might cause to happen in our lives. What opportunities may be open to us that were never open to us before. Imagine the things that God may be able to achieve in and through our lives in ways that we would never experience unless we allowed the maturing of the Spirit to work in us so that we would attain to all that God has for us. That's my heart. So my hope is that you will stick along with me. We're going to give you the measuring chart so you can figure out where you are so you can get to where you necessarily want to go. And so bow your heads with me. Close your eyes. Let me pray for you. Father, today, give all of us the courage and the strength to be all that you've called and created us to be. Give us, almighty God, the determination to say, here am I, Lord. I want to grow up. It's time to grow up. I'm not going to make excuses any longer. I'm going to give your word a place, a priority, a place of honor in my heart. And I'm going to let you do what only you can do because I trust you. I love you. You are my father. And I want to grow up. I want to be like Jesus. And I know I can't do that on my own. But Lord, your word in me, nothing is impossible with you. And I believe, therefore, Lord, Nothing is impossible to them that believe. So have your way. Let me grow up into him in everything.